up, wake up. You've got the power. You've got the My people wake up. in the east, yo, you gotta wake up. Midwest, dirty south, yo, you gotta stand up. All my homies in the west, yo, you gotta wake up. Wake up, wake up, wake up, wake up. I'm Rosa Mustafa. I'm going to be your host and moderator today. And this is the Charlotte Black Film Festival. And we are um, reviewing and examining the impact of climate change on frontline communities. And the film that we're going to be reviewing is Ain't Your Mama's Heat Wave. Again, I'm Rosa Mustafa. I'm a Mecklenburg County Air Quality Commissioner. I'm also an employee of the Sierra Club of North Carolina and the founder of Progressive Black Environmental Caucus. So we hope you enjoy this production. You've got the power. You've got my the people power. in the East, yo, you gotta wake up. Midwest, dirty south, yo, you gotta stand up. All my homies in the West, yo, you gotta wake up. Wake up, wake up, wake up, wake up. Wake up, wake up, wake up, wake up. Wake up, wake up, wake up. Um, Drew, if you wanna do your introduction, that would be great. Yeah, hey everybody, I'm Drew Ball. I'm the State Director for Environment North Carolina. Uh, I hail from Winston-Salem and uh, I've worked for a number of environmental organizations, uh, including the Sierra Club here in North Carolina. And it's really an honor to be with everybody and so excited to discuss this film. Good, thank you for that. And our next person, let's see, after Drew is Wanda. She's not here, she had an illness, so she won't be participating today. So we're gonna move to Wong. Wong who is here in Raleigh. Juan is also in Raleigh as an activist. They work a lot of time hand in glove in some of the work, so I'll give it to Juan. Thanks, Roselle. Now, my name is Juan. I am currently a group chair for the capital group of the North Carolina Sierra Club. Um, on top of that, I am a, I'm also a, uh, a a member of the Wake County Health Justice Coalition outside of the work because Personally, I am I'm invested in both the work for environmental justice and also racial justice. Both of these um, kind of hit home for me in many ways. Um, and be, besides the stuff that I do for activism and advocacy, I'm also a, a graduate student here at NC State University. So, um, yeah, juggling a lot of stuff, but I'm trying. But all, all, all the stuff that I do kind of just ties into one another. So in a way, yeah, there's a lot of work. On the other hand, it all just kind of streamlines for me. So it works out. But today I'm here to talk to you all about the film and hopefully share some of the experience of the work that I do based on the films that I, the film that we've all watched. So um, I look forward to having a conversation with everybody here. Thank you, Wa. Our next panelist is Alicia Jenkins. Now she's in Connecticut and she's also one of our lead organizers with the Sierra Club. Alicia. Hello. Hi, um, my name is Alicia Jenkins. I go by she, her. Um, I am the lead campaign organizer for Ready for 100 in Hartford, Connecticut. Um, what else am I supposed to? <laughs> Um, just your background, you know. Oh, um, I have been an activist since I was 16. I'm originally from Chicago, from the west side of Chicago, and I have been throwing tables at politicians since I was a teenager. So, um, I've been with Sierra Club since August of last year, and uh, environmental justice and environmental racism, I I've experienced it growing up. I from Chicago when the heat waves, so I like the title of this film when the heat wave hits, mm -hmm. the black communities in Chicago get hit the hardest. A lot of times we can't afford AC. So this film really struck a chord with me and I loved that. So anywho, um, okay. So yeah, <laughs> sorry. Okay. okay, thank you very much, Alicia. And our next person is Lynn Godfrey. She's out of my home state of Virginia and she's with the Sierra Club. Lynn? 
Yes, thank you for inviting me, um, the Film Festival for inviting me to participate in this panel. I am Lynn Godfrey, uh, she, her, hers. I work with um, the Sierra, I work for the Sierra Club as a community outreach mm -hmm. coordinator for Stop the Pipelines. And I live in the area where the film was, where the, where the documentary was filmed. So I'm very familiar with the content of, as far as environmental justice and empowering communities for just transitions. So I look forward for our lively discussion today. Thank you. Thank you, Lynn. I wanna first do a little bit of housekeeping too. I wanna to thank Tommy Nichols and the Charlotte Black Film Festival for giving us this platform so we can definitely amplify the message of, environment, of the environmental work that we're doing here in North Carolina. And also just to undergird all of the, the grassroots people, all of us here are in grassroots. Some of us are grass top in the work. And we kind of go hand in glove again with um, pushing this along. And it's such, it's a big piece. Climate you know, change is kind of the overarching, but it encompasses so much of what goes on in our environment and the challenges that we you know, face day to day, energy burden, um, uh, displacement, all of that is, you look at climate change, and it all has a part in it. So I want to thank the Charlotte Film Festival for giving us this platform, Tommy Nichols, and also Bev for coordinating it. Um, let's see. So we want to go ahead and move on. I sent out a list of questions to everybody so they could kind of get an idea of, of where we we're going to go with this. After watching the film, do, do um, you want the other, you want sorry. Crystal and Cynthia to introduce themselves as well? Uh, Do you sorry, want Crystal, Crystal did, and Cynthia? They didn't introduce okay. themselves yet. Okay, Crystal, I thought she did an introduction, but please, I'm sorry. Could you please introduce yourself? Hi, it's okay. And I guess I'll lower, yeah, I'll lower my hand now. Uh, hi, I'm Crystal Bullock. I'm a climate justice fellow with Hip Hop Caucus, Think 100. Um, my background is in public health, health disparities, and neuroscience and toxicology. I um, worked at USDA for a few years, and I um, live in Charlotte, North Carolina now. And um, this film him home just for my background in environmental justice and my research in like toxicology and health impacts from environmental racism. My family's from the Warren County, Vance County area. So I had family members that participated um, in the PCB landfill protest. Um, I also attended Hampton University. So I'm very familiar with the area. So um, mm -hmm. a lot of reasons why this film hits home and just really happy to be here. Okay, thank you for that. And sure. Cynthia, did, did you want to add on anything? Cynthia Satterfield? Um, hi, everybody. I'm Cynthia Satterfield, um, the North Carolina Sierra Club chapter director, and I go by she, hers. I'm here mostly as an observer. I have not benefited from seeing the film yet, um, but plan to do that. And, and glad to hear uh, all of the geographical perspectives that folks are bringing to this. I'm getting attacked by an insect, sorry. <laughs> um, and uh, very familiar with, with Warren County, Vance County, and um, beautiful part of the state. So I'm just going to sit back and just, uh, you know, partake, absorb. Okay, good deal. So the good thing about this panel is that we, I think we see about three generations in here. So everybody can kind of give their perspective on, you know, the work that I think it's really become in the forefront over this past maybe, you know, decade or so, eight years, that the climate and the energy has been like really pushed politically. We all knew it was there. We all knew it was challenges, but we had a hard time in getting it to the forefront. So now we have the opportunity. It's kind of like now we have the ball. Now we got to, we have to score our touchdowns, right? So, and we have to put our teams together. All of us have a grassroots experience and that's really great. And we all do a lot of organizing, whether we are organizing Gen X, we're organizing millennials, where we're organizing uh, boomers, what have you. We all come together for that common cause. And that's very important. Um, and I, I get very happy to see the younger generation really championing this work and pushing it out in their own way, using their own voices. And, and that is what we saw in this, this film that we just reviewed. You know, it just, it was comedy, but it was comedy with a purpose. Like if we would say party with a purpose or whatever, this was definitely comedy with a purpose. Trying to get everybody 
you know, going the same way in the same path as far as environmental work, at least lifting up the issues as they are. And what the film did, it looked at um, the market of Norfolk, Virginia. It's a very flat uh, terrain. And the, the flooding is probably, is definitely due to the infrastructure not being able to support the waters. That's your flash floods. We get them here in Charlotte as well. But um, the person that probably could give us the most insight into that is the person that lives in that market right now. So Lynn, if you could share your insight in the problems that occurred, we talk about Norfolk and that terrain and flooding. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, I, yeah, it floods here in Norfolk is, um, uh, you know, is below sea level and it is one of the major geographical regions that's been impacted by sea level rise. It is in southeastern Virginia, however, um, the very lower part of southeastern Virginia. Um, so it's impacted by flooding, it's impacted by sea level rise, coastal uh, disturbances and deterioration, and all of those things. It doesn't just impact the film talked about the uh, St. Paul's Quarter, and that's the little sexy name they've given it since urban renewal and gentrification. Uh, but most of the uh, areas that they talked about, the, um, the neighborhoods, the Tidewater Park, the Young's Park, those are projects. They're owned by the Norfolk Redevelopment Housing Authority, and they're being torn down. I think one of the synopses that I read uh, in the film, uh, not on, not doing the filming, but the synopsis of the film is that they were being torn down because of climate change and the impact of flooding. That's not true. They're being torn down for sure, but it's for urban renewal. Uh, but they mm -hmm. have been impacted disproportionately. I can't really say they've been impacted disproportionately by flooding because all in, a lot most of Norfolk floods. You have some very high income areas that flood too. And it just goes back to how we adapt to these adverse uh, weather patterns because of climate change. So is, you know, the adaptability of a poor person is gonna be different from that of someone living in what we call near Old Dominion University in the Launch Mount neighborhood that, that uh, a lot of retirees came to from, uh, the, from the New England area. And they flood out too when they've had, but they've had the means to uh, uplift their foundations and those type of mitigations uh, that would uh, help them save their property. Where if you live, so, and also it, it floods a lot, but for those folks that, that were, we were talking, that, that were mainly talked about in the film, they don't have the adverse effect from uh, real estate because like I said, those properties are owned by the Housing and Redevelopment Authority and they have been um, forced to move so that the, the, the city can rebuild what they call mixed income housing. And they have been given vouchers which much of them cannot use because uh, landlords do not want to accept them for all types of races and adverse beliefs about poor people. So, so I, I think what that lends itself to is that uh, real estate is not the only cause, the adverse cause to flooding. So you have uh, public health, you have issues of health, you have issues of food insecurity, all of those things that impact uh, folks who are experiencing flooding on a regular basis. So um, those are some of the impacts that they're, they're, they're experiencing their flood, uh, food insecurity. So um, I'm having trouble I'm connecting sorry, to the talking internet. too loud in my it Alexa, like come on. Cheap, <laughs> device. So sorry about that. Okay. But anyway, that's, that's kind of my, 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 my take on that. On Thank you, Lynn. I appreciate that. Um, so with Lynn's perspective, and that's not, it, you know, so much different from what goes on in Charlotte, gentrification, changing in communities, what have you, usually happens to marginalized communities, frontline communities. And that's what this movie and this film was about. Ancient Mama's Heat Wave is definitely about, you know, the, the marginalized communities that are impacted by climate change. So uh, we sent out a couple questions and I'm gonna give this first one to Drew. After reviewing Ancient Mama's Heat Wave, what is your reaction to the comedic take on a very serious topic. Yeah, so I um, I love the film. I'm a huge stand-up comedy fan. Rosa, when you asked me part of this, 
I was so thrilled. I get to watch comedy for, for work, which doesn't happen very often. But, um, you know, Reverend Cohn's quote at the beginning, which kind of to summarize, talked about the power of comedy to, to make light what is dark in our lives. Um, and I thought the comics were great. I stayed in stitches throughout. Um, and, and they really did use their comedy as a tool to create change. Um, they touched on really difficult topics. Um, I think it was Kristen Seville who's talking about the, the problem with flooding. And it's like, are we going to be taking our boats to the BP? Is that going to be like the new Hangout Spider-Man show? And like, it's it's funny, but it's it's not, right? And so comedy's ability to take what is dark and what is hard and um, make us think about it in new and interesting ways, um, you know, that's there's a long uh, history of, of comedy um, being on the edge and calling us out and making us think. And so I say kudos to Think 100 for this film, um, for being creative or thinking outside of the box about how we tackle these issues, because this film is going to speak to people in a way that um, an action alert or, you know, a legislative update w will not. And, um, you know, little known fact, uh, I've done some stand up in my time, some open mic. And that's not to say that I'm, I'm funny, because actually quite the opposite. Um, but to say that I, I understand that feeling when you have a room of people looking at you and you're about to say something that's gonna ruffle feathers, but it's gonna force people to think. And so um, I thought it was beautiful how they did it. And in this line of work, you really do have to keep a sense of humor because the work is so hard and we deal with such um, scary things that impact people's lives um, and those facts and figures that we rattle off every day. Um, you know, it doesn't make us hard, but it, I think it uh, makes us feel and hurt more often. And so comedy is a really key piece to deal with that. Thank you, I appreciate that. Um, Alicia, did you wanna add anything to that? Well, I'm also an artist. So I'm sorry I didn't say that in my background. I okay. said everything else but that. Um, so as an artist, I've, I've found it very clever that they were able to merge the arts with climate change. And so I've been trying to do that in Hartford by doing storytelling and poetry. So I love the poetry aspect that they had in it too. But I do appreciate the comedic relief as well because it got people engaged and made them really think like, oh, this is really happening, so. Absolutely. Why did you, you wanna try, you wanna give your take on that as far as, you know, the reaction to using comedy and levity on a very serious topic? Yeah, I mean, just kind of adding to what Drew and Alicia has already said, I mean, a pattern that I noticed with the way the comedians organize the sketches. First of all, I'm not, I don't watch a lot of stand-up comedy, so kind of the, I guess, polar opposite from Drew and Alicia, because oh, this is really not my thing. But um, I did notice that they first they will talk about their, their own personal awareness of how climate change affect them personally, and then they tie that with something from their personal life, whether or not that's directly related to climate change. And that could be about their children, their love lives. And I think that, like those specific moments that they bring up are basically a reminder for reasons why we're fighting for any of this, I think. It's because we want to make sure that there's a good home for our family, the good home for our, for children, future generations. That's kind of what, what we're doing any of this for, like climate change is, the fight to um, protect our communities from the impact of climate change is very much about thinking about the future, about the generation. Yeah. And yeah. also the moments like this are probably painful that they live with, turning that into a laughter. I think that's the way to confront it. I think um, this is where we are with confronting climate crisis because yeah, this is awful. Our elected officials are not doing enough. Giant corporates are responsible for most of the pollution and environmental destruction, and they're still not being held accountable. Um, but laughter, songs, they I see them as weapons against oppressors. To me, mm -hmm. the way they tell the oppressors that we are still standing. Yes. These are signs of strength and resilience. So that's, my, that's what my thought was when I was watching a stand-up. Thank you. And I, I feel the same way. Sometimes we get very burnt out as advocates and, adv and um, advocacy work, and it can be draining. So if we have opportunities for levity, opportunities for comedy, such as Adrian Mama's Heat Wave, I think that that's an excellent way to kind of release, especially 
given the fact that we've been kind of sequestered in this pandemic this whole time, trying to do our advocacy work and our outreach in such a limited capacity, uh, it was definitely needed. So I, I applaud those uh, creative people who put it together, the Hip Hop Caucus uh, for pushing it out. So I think it's a really great piece of great work. Crystal, did you wanna add anything? I didn't wanna leave you out. I'm just going to echo what a lot of my fellow panelists said, you know, in the power of using humor and storytelling to really push, push messages, um, you know, and just major kudos how this was, you know, this film was Black produced, the, the lighting, recording, everything, you know, was all Black production. And even the history of the Atticus Theater, you know, it was built by Black entrepreneurs during the Spanish flu pandemic while we're here in another pandemic. So another, lots of parallels there. But um, one, we can keep it going, but I really did just want to echo from what my future panelists said, like, and just how we can use uh, truly I feel like Black communities have used bringing, turning lemons into lemonade and using humor in our tools as our weapons against oppression and to use storytelling as a method to get messages out across generations. And I feel like humor is a common thread across generations that you can use to get the message out. Okay, thank you for that. Um, the next question is, um, let's look at how has climate change impacted your respective communities. So we're talking more so on the individuals in the cities in which they live, whether it's a metropolitan area or rural. Climate change is impacted um, in so many different ways. So I'm gonna start with Watt. I hate to go back to you because we were just, but we were just talking about the storms that were in Alabama. So I'm gonna start with you, Watt. And um, you can share some of the things that have happened. I think it's Rochester Heights out mm -hmm. in Raleigh. Yeah. Yeah, actually, um... I'm glad you brought up Rochester Heights because um, the Capital Group, we just had a um, a webinar last night with uh, Mr. Amin Davis, who is a board member of the Partners for Environmental Justice. And he was basically talking about the history of Rochester Heights. So I learned from him that um, there was a massive thing. First of all, there's a massive thing. So brief history, um, there was a massive increase in development from 1974 to 1998 in Rochester Heights, and Rochester Heights is a floodplain. Funny enough, or not funny enough, the Army Corps engineer wrote a letter in 1986 saying that they did not find any significant change in the flood damage or development for this area. They were significantly alter our prior findings. And they determined that the problem with the area would just be basic form, basic storm drainage problems. So fast forward to today, People who live in Rochester Heights have seen major floodings, case in point, when Hurricane Fran came in 1996, and yet even then, the city council at the time still made homeowners cover a portion of that cost. Now, Rochester Heights is a historic district built for a Black community during segregation, so we piece the history together. It does make you wonder what, what other factor actually compelled the Army Corps engineer at the time to generate a re report like they did in 1986 saying, oh, there's no problem. Also, in, in addition to flood risk, I also see that urban heat island is going to be a big issue mm -hmm. in cities, especially for people who are children, elderly, chronically ill. They're going to need more time to recover and cool down in heat. And historic redlining has led to hot spot coming to poor communities of color. And, you know, Raleigh is one of the cities that's starting a program this summer where they're asking for volunteers to take neighborhood temperature as a kind of heat island, heat island mapping project. Mm -hmm. Now with all that in mind, the city of Raleigh just approved a rezoning last December to basically redevelop over 135 acres of land that's gonna impact the black communities, especially in Southeast Raleigh. Now, if Wanda Gilbert Coco was here, I would, hand, I would yield the floor to her talk about this because she lives there. Yes. But she's not, so I, but, so I was trying my best to basically talk about the issues that, that she and I are working to fight back it basically, this rezoning was rejected unanimously by planning commission, and it still got approved by city council last year. More sources need to be put into consideration to address how downstream communities are going to be affected and how what they're going to do to be to protect the community from things like increased flood risk. Because if you're going to be developing with even more impervious surfaces, that's going to make more places more susceptible to flood. And as climate change, there's no doubt we're going to be seeing more extreme weather. Now, I just also want to add that's all right. We're also right now seeing business owners who got told by local 
landowners that their lease is no longer going to be renewed and they're going to be kicked out in like two months or so. So we're talking about people who are going to be priced out of their home, not just by flood or increased living expense because of what a city failed to do to protect people back then, but also being displaced because landowners want to see more profit for themselves. So we're seeing a lot of things coming in that's going to impact Black community more ways than one. So that's what we're dealing with Raleigh right now. Thank you, Wa. Uh, I'm sorry, I, I've overlooked someone, a, a gentleman who just joined us, Charles, is it Charles Brown? Can you yes, ma'am. Hi, how are you? I'm good. I'm doing well. How are you doing? Good. Everything's good? They are. Do you want to introduce yourself? Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, for everybody, how you guys doing? Sorry, but uh, I was late a little bit. Um, my name is Charles Brown, um, also known as Batman. Uh, I am a representative of the Hip Hop Caucus and uh, uh, was definitely a part of putting together uh, the Ancient Mama's Heat Wave uh, comedy concert. Um, I want to say really quickly, um, it was it was definitely a pleasure. Um, being a native of the area, um, it was everything that was done was done with intention. Um, every every person that was a part of that thing um, worked really really hard to make sure um, that the message was delivered properly and within context. Um, from from the comics to you know the ground team, we we did we spent a lot of time trying to make sure we had the right strategic partners. Um, that we got the, the right word out to, to all of the communities, that we made it as inclusive and uh, appealing and uh, was able to be appreciated by as many people as possible. Um, and, I, and I think we succeeded mostly. I mean, I still get people that walk up to me now and ask, what, are the hip -hop, what is the hip hop caucus gonna do next in our area? Right. Um, there were people here who didn't even necessarily connect um, the fact of the, the, high, the high rising tide um, or, or the high sea levels with, you know, uh, you know, flooding in downtown Norfolk. And just what the other gentleman said, um, we're actually going through some of that gentrification now um, and some of people being um, removed from their from their housing um, in downtown Norfolk right now, being priced out of it and having to find other places to live. And so all of this stuff is kind of interconnected. Um, but, you know, I, I think uh, figure out ways to, to bridge the gap between arts, music, culture, politics, and social justice um, and making, again, appealing to the masses. I think we can get messaging um, to a place um, where, where more people want to join into the fight and, and helping these different causes that we all have. Okay. Thank you uh, for attending today. Yes, uh, ma'am. I'm going to give this, the same question over to um, Drew. How does climate change impact your respective communities? And I think you're in what, uh, Ash, Asheville, right? Yeah, I am. I'm in Asheville. Um, but I actually grew up outside of Winston-Salem, North Carolina, in Forsyth County. And um, I actually grew up swimming in Blues Creek, uh, which is going off the rope swing and having a good time. And it actually cooled one of the reactors for Duke Energy. And there, it was a lake where we loved it, but it, sometimes in the summer and spring, you go out there and the water would almost be warmer than it was outside. But I had fond memories of growing up out there. And um, when I got older, I was actually living in DC and the, the Dan River coal ash spill happened uh, mm -hmm. in which, you know, uh, tons and tons and tons of dangerous coal ash, arsenic, I mean, chromium, all types of nasty things flooded into the Dan River when the um, when their coal ash containment ponds broke. And that flooded into the Dan River and flooded down into Blues Creek. And um, that was part of the reason when I was living in DC, I, I thought I really got to get home and work in my community because that is a legacy of, of fossil fuel extraction. Um, you know, yes. these landscapes that are, um, can be sacrificed um, at the cost of doing business. Um, and, you know, I look back now, now that I have the information and I can see the, the testing of Blues Creek and see the levels of um, all types of things that are um, the result of burning fossil fuels. And I think about how I may have been affected by that as a child, how kids these days are probably still swimming in Blues Creek and that, that pollution is ending up in their bloodstream. And um, it's a, it's a, I carry that with me and it's a big part of what I do. Um, and, and that's right where I grew up. Okay, thank you for that, Drew. Um, Lynn, did you want to add anything? I think we've kind of looked at Norfolk's uh, flooding situation and some of the climate challenges, but did you want to add anything additional to that? Well, yes, I mean, yeah, we're impacted by uh, a lot of different intersections of uh, climate change, you know, the root cause of climate, climate change throughout the centuries, of course, has been the uh, fossil fuel industry, and that has been, you know, 
the, um, the greenhouse gas emissions uh, that it has emitted for centuries, which has caused the uh, climate change. We're, we're looking at droughts in this area, a lot of this impact impacting uh, food and agriculture, as well as you know the sea level rise, but all of those things. But also the racism, we talk about the racism is interesting that um, if you follow the route of where most black people in the uh, sea level rise or coastal resilience areas around the uh, eastern part of the United States, that pattern also follows the padding of the Atlantic slave trade from, mm -hmm. from, from Maryland to Virginia to North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, Florida, uh, Mississippi, Alabama, New, uh, Louisiana. So that was an interesting thing uh, when I was doing some research on flooding and sea level rise and, and coastal resilience and all that stuff, is that what places the most at risk folks poor and black people and indigenous people and especially black people on this coast is the placement of us here by the Atlantic slave trade. I just thought that was an interesting correlation, but um, yeah. So yeah, we're impacted by all those things, coal ash um, from uh, bringing the uh, coal through the ports here in Virginia, Newport News and uh, Norfolk especially has been disproportionately impacted by coal ash and uh, suffer tremendously from asthma and other respiratory diseases because of that. So the state has now given some funds through the Department of um, Environmental Quality to, um, to address that issue. So yeah, we're most definitely impacted by all of that. Okay, thank you. Um, I wanna just take a moment to just lift up a voice in the environmental work out in Bladen County, North Carolina, there was, was an advocate named Elsie Herring. Um, she consistently fought uh, Smithfield as litigants in court about the uh, chip, the snails and the living conditions that Smithfield and the hog farming industry had placed that community under. She had lived on the property for over a hundred, her family lived on the property for over a hundred years. She actually died last month and she died mm. of respiratory complications. Her name was Elsie Herring. And she, like I said, she was a true environmental warrior. You can look her up, Google her name and look at her life's work. So we need to keep people like that lifted up and remember their names, say their names, because, you know, they were out there way before, probably before a lot of us got out there, they, you know, fighting the good fight. And she won. And what I hate to see is uh, a lot of brown, you know, advocates and people, citizens who have to take on these industries and they are so outgunned by the industry. You know, as soon as you win one case, they are appealing it and taking it back in court and there you go again. And it is a very vicious cycle. And that's what happened with Ms. Herring and a number of other people too. You know, they are very formidable opponents. Industry is not gonna back down easy. We try to run the game of running the clock out because what I have found is that industry may have the funds and resources, but what they don't have is time. I've worked in banking for a long, long time and I understand business very well. They don't have a lot of time to, to, in order to get their projects lifted and moving forward. So that's where you can kind of have a toehold in the environmental work, you know, maybe, you know, pushing back and making them go back for environmental impact reports, forestry reports, whatever you need to do to slow them down. If you can slow them down, you possibly can stop them. But it gets very exhausting as advocates. You run out of moves and you get frustrated. I see it time and time, I feel it a lot, but we have to just keep going with the work. So, and I wanna just encourage and motivate all of us to you know, stand a fight, stay on that battlefield. You know, we're gonna have some victories in this. But Elsie Heron, just, you know, if you got time, Google her, her name and remember her. Uh, does anybody else wanna, um, did I, anybody else wanna uh, chime in, Crystal, on the question regarding climate change and the impact on um, your respective communities? Did you wanna give any sure. insight into that? Yeah, and Rosa, you probably are some familiar with some of these stories because living in Charlotte, um, the Colonial Pipeline leak sure. um, coming into Huntersville, and if anyone is from the area of her, the stories, there's been an outbreak in the past five to seven years of this rare eye cancer in the Huntersville area, which is north of the Charlotte community. So we're not really surprised there's a lot of correlation going on there. Um, the new light rail that's built in the city, you know, there's lots of controversy about, you know, where the light rail was built and like possible 
um, complications with that, with communities being right beside the lines of the light rail. Um, Charlotte's also going through a lot of construction in different suburbs and communities, and so that's having an impact um, with the soil and the water systems here, and especially when it rains, it seems to like start to cause different types of flooding and similar to some things that are just going on in North Carolina in general with our different hurricanes. Granted, Charlotte, I don't feel like it's the brunt of it because we're not next to the coast, but you know, a lot when it a lot is going on in regards to different leaks going in the community. Um, also out right outside of Fort Mill Rock Hill area, which is south of Charlotte near South Carolina, um, the Indy Mill has causing different smells, like a lot of community members have been reporting to um, officials about the smell that they're getting from the Indy Mill as well. Thank you for that, um, Crystal. Um, Alicia, sorry. I didn't want did to leave you out at all. You in Hartford, Connecticut. Um, yes. I know we talk from time to time on some of the challenges. Um, so if you want to share that, that would be great. Well, one thing that's affecting Hartford right now is energy burdens. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, my campaign with Ready from 100 will be focusing on energy burdens on the north end of Hartford, which is predominantly the, uh, the predominantly black part of the city. And just to go into what Lynn was talking about with the transatlantic slave trade, a lot of people think that that trade didn't occur in the north. It did, <laughs> by way of Rhode Island, um, Connecticut, and New York. Those were the ports. One of the largest ports in the north was from Rhode Island province of Plantation and uh, New York State or city. And um, so the slave ships also made its way through the Connecticut River and made its way to Hartford. The last slave ship that came here was 1760 um, in the same area in which that path of the last slave ship is where black folk started to live in downtown Hartford. And they were forced to move to the North end of Hartford. Um, and so what I'm, finding out in the research that we are starting to do in, in Hartford is energy burdens and like, not just, not just how much it costs to have to like pay for your energy, but like how um, people are being displaced as a result of them not being able to afford their energy cost. Um, we just, and I'm looking at articles right now about the uh, recycling plant called Mira. Um, we, just got it closed, just got it closed, or it, it, we're in the process of having Nira agree to close um, because it has been causing a lot of asthma on the north end of Hartford to a lot of the students who I teach. Um, so yeah, that's how it's affecting us in the north. And I think Wa had said something about how urban settings deal with a lot of heat waves mm -hmm. because of the concrete. And mm -hmm. we're dealing with that in Hartford, unfortunately, as well. Yep, we do. We have heat islands here in the metros, and that's where heat um, kind of sits in the center between those buildings, and they cause just an enormous, um, um, they cause respiratory problems. You know, the, the population as they grow, that is very much a concern in the metro areas. Breathing uh, is a little bit different when you get out into our rural areas. When you talk about the rural areas, you're probably looking at more, you know, particular matter maybe from of uh, some of the, like the rock quarries and things like that. We have a couple of rock quarries here that do their part as far as putting things into the environment <clears throat> and the air quality. The air quality suffers as a direct relation to climate change too. So does anybody else have anything that they wanna add to that subject we just discussed as far as, um, you know, the impact in your respective communities? Just okay. one others, if you don't mind me, including about the heat islands. I think this is audible reason why um, I feel like more people need to advocate for preservation of tree canopy that we have because they provide shadings, they help with um, recycling the carbon dioxide, all the good stuff. But um, when, we, when it comes to development, I feel like a lot of times um, this clear cutting is a major issue and we mm -hmm. move trees and you generate then you generate heat islands and here in north carolina i also know that wood pellet industry is huge so i can't help but wonder if part of the reason why clear cutting is so rampant in north carolina is because lumber is 
uh, the lumber industry profits from this as they're shipping with pallet to England to burn for their fuel. Mm. I recommend people watching Burned. That's a good documentary for that. Okay, okay. But um, there was a study as far as heat, uh, energy burdens. Uh, I think Bloomberg uh, was, had uh, funded that study. And the average cost on, as far as national cost is 3.6. Charlotte, North Carolina's energy burden is at 12%. So that's significantly higher. So when, that means that people who have, um, you know, fixed incomes and we are elderly, some of our people who are on fixed income, some of our people who, you know, uh, have suffered some type of financial hardship, that's gonna be a problem. We're looking at that with the Ready for 100 here in Charlotte, as far as um, how do we, mitigate those damages? How do we help those families, you know, with that situation? We, and that's more of an end user perspective because we're, again, coming in at the end of it. How do we start at the beginning of it and change it? The narrative, how do we change that narrative as environmentalists? You know, how do we, fast can we move to solar? All of these things have to be asked. We have to have a legislature that will move on some of the things give the funding that's needed for some of these uh, things to take place. So that's been a challenge in North Carolina. I'm sure it's a challenge in other states too. I think I don't think we're so different, but um, our, heat, our energy burden is quite high at 12%. So does anybody else um, want to share anything else regarding? Um, uh, yeah, I, I think I would add, um, and I think somebody touched on it earlier. Um, every time I'm going through the Monitor and Merrimack Tunnel going into Newport News, um, there's, there's a, a neighborhood uh, on the right side, and there is absolutely a, a coal plant on the left side, and, and the smell is, is very distinct. And I think about it all the time, the, the generational impact on, you know, the, the asthma and, you know, breathing problems that, you know, generationally, you know, the, that community, you know, has struggled with and, you know, is something actually being done or, you know, could more be done? And I understand that there could be. Um, but, but I think it's, it's important for us to, you know, continue to uplift those kind of messages and let people know that that stuff doesn't happen by happenstance. A lot of times those, those places are put there or can be removed as easily um, or not considered when people are trying to build these things because it wouldn't happen in, you know, a lot of these suburbs and, and upper echelon, you know, communities. It just wouldn't happen. Um, you know, but, it, uh, you know, we've seen time and time again that it does happen to sometimes under, underserved communities or communities of black and brown communities. So, I, I do think about that a lot, you know, um, more, more needs to be done. I think, um, you know, uh, us uh, continuing to, to, to bring this up um, in media and how, whatever platforms or influence that we have is important in, in trying to continue to, to organize and, and fight against that kind of stuff. Again, we're talking about the health, um, you know, I'm sure it's a dollar in financial benefit to them, but to our communities, you know, this, the stuff that that's, you know, that, that, you know, that uh, the byproducts of, of coal and all of that stuff does to our communities is, you know, something that would be felt for a long time. And I think uh, it's important that we continue, again, to, to kind of um, put that message out there as, with as loud a megaphone as we possibly can. Um, I would just like, and maybe Drew can kind of, because Drew deals with a lot of policy. Um, and when we talk about these communities of color, frontline communities, sacrifice zones, we, we need to have data. Because whenever I have a conversation about it with any legislature or any I'm dealing with policy, because really, when you look at the environmental movement, it's all going to be fought in policy. Okay, We can be out here on the streets doing activists all we want to, but at the end of the day, the policy has to be changed. So that's our goal, change the policy. So I want to ask, um, whenever you're looking at particular areas, there's some mapping tools that the environmental uh, justice department has in which you can put in the address and it will tell you if this is a super fun site what particular matter is involved in that community whether it's VOCs, HAPs, what have you and that will give you the data that you need to then say okay city council okay county commissioners this is our problem this is why we can't make you know allow additional uh, activities in this area we can't allow maybe a, an organ, like a company, a rock quarry to add a line of business because it's already strong contaminants in that market in that particular area. And that's what's causing the asthma. That's what's causing the respiratory problems. You see what I'm saying? But Drew, I wanted to kind of throw that over to you because you deal a lot in policy and the challenges that you see in North Carolina, probably it is in other states as well. Absolutely. And, and so two things, I just want to speak quickly to the topic we were just on. And this kind of touches on what 
our history that climate change may force us to lose. And then the second thing I want to talk about is kind of a current day um, processes that are failing us right now. But looking at history, I think we have to mention here in North Carolina, we talk about what climate change threatens, um, the history of Princeville, North Carolina. And Princeville was where former slaves took refuge in the Civil War at a U.S. Army camp um, in the Tar River floodplain. And they called their encampment Freedom Hill. And it was later incorporated in uh, 1885. Uh, it was the first all black town independently governed African-American community and uh, in the United States. And the recent hurricanes that we've had, these hundred year floods that we've now had multiple in recent years um, is, is really hitting Princeville hard. And uh, a lot of people in that community are having to make the decision if they're, they're gonna move away and, and walk away from that, that, their homes and that history. And so that's part of the history we can, we, we're facing, we can lose, but if we look at modern day processes about how government's failing us just today in um, the, the state, in the general assembly, there's a committee hearing where they're looking at a farm bill. And what that farm bill could, would do is that it would allow for a permitting process for waste to gas facilities. And what that would do are these same facilities that Elsie Herring fought against. Um, mm -hmm. It allows them to lock in a system where they are uh, turning waste to energy, uh, which on its face doesn't sound bad, but what it allows is them to continue these processes that are um, creating odors, creating mm -hmm. um, hardships for the, their neighbors next door down the street. And, and this would allow them to lock that in, continue that making money off of it. And it is inadequate on the public hearing processes. It is uh, steamrolling these communities. And so that data that you mentioned is really, really important. Um, that data can be the light. It's um, what someone once told me is the light and heat theory. We have that light to show them the data, but we also got to bring the heat, which is the power, the advocacy, the communities, people speaking up and um, letting elected officials know that we're going to listen to the data and we're not going to allow them to, to steamroll our communities anymore. Thank you for that. Rez, um, I had something to add just to what Drew was saying, if it's okay. Sure, go ahead, Cynthia. Um, yeah, I think it's important, uh, Drew, you were in on that committee meeting and, and just to flesh out the story for folks. Um, you know, sometimes in those committee hearings, certain people are allowed to have a voice and certain people are not allowed to have a voice when it comes to public comment. Um, and that issue was raised up in today's committee hearing where uh, much more time was uh, given to proponents of the biogas um, provision in this bill than was given to the opponents. Um, the members of the community that were going to be impacted were left out of being able to give their comments uh, during this process. Um, so that's, I think, something important to, to keep in mind um, is that we need to continue to beat the drum to make sure that opportunities are provided for people to have a voice when they're being the most impacted. And then the other thing I just wanted to point out too is that, you know, we're, we've talked a lot about urban areas, but um, one concern for me having lived in rural North Carolina is um, the disparities uh, between the rural uh, poor and people of color and those who live on the coast. Oftentimes when we get hit by hurricanes, the focus is on the damage to the oceanfront homes. Mm -hmm. um, but in rural North Carolina, we know population-wise, the demographics are changing. People are leaving rural areas and they're moving to more urban areas. And the people who are left behind are people who don't have opportunity. They don't have education, they don't have jobs. And so they are left much more vulnerable to pressures for economic development, um, to develop wood pellet uh, uh, facilities and things of that nature. So you know, that I think is also just part of the, part of the mix here. Um, and uh, you know, again, it's gonna take policy, but it's also gonna take the right people elected to public office to pass mm -hmm. the right kind of policy. Um, so it kind of starts at the, at the grassroots level, as we've said, getting those people in leadership positions so that they, uh, we, you have the right voice um, in leadership that can make those policies happen. Thank you for that, Cynthia. Appreciate that. Um, we have staff meetings, and the farm bill is something that comes. This has been coming up, I guess, for over a month now. And the censorship basically is what's happening uh, with 
hearing the arguments as far as the public is concerned, but we're not the only uh, state that's doing that. I think that's going on in a number of other areas. Um, it's just hard to get, it's hard to get their ear. The people who make the policy and can make the laws mm -hmm. that make a difference, it's hard to get their ears that way. So, but we just have to keep pushing. Um, I'm sorry, Alicia, yeah. do you want to say something? I'm and, sorry. In regards to keep it pushing, this is, this is why I really appreciated this film um, even more so, like going back to the film. Yes. Like what we can do to get these people to listen is mm -hmm. through the arts. We can mm -hmm. bring it, we can bring a show to their, their streets, to their office um, and tell our stories, tell them, you know, and put a face to the data. So yes, we give them data. I agree with you, Drew. They need the data. Um, but they need to also see the faces of the people that the data represents. Not to sound like a poet, but like <laughs> that 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 needs to happen. And I think right. that that's one tool in the toolbox that we should be able to use. And what I appreciate about this film is that the arts was used, that the poetry was used, that the comedic relief was used. And this, you put that in front of a mayor, like you can't, he can't deny that. He or she can't, you know, deny that. So I just want to put that out there. Thank you, Alicia, for putting that out there. <laughs> our next question, and we're getting kind of close to our timeline. Um, let's see. As it relates to climate change, what do you feel that an NGO and those who do the work in advocacy should focus on the most? Should it be policy, education, advocacy? So, uh, Crystal, you want to start out? Yeah, I don't think you can pick just one. They all have to be interconnected to, to get the message done because different groups and populations and generations receive it. You know, I'm a data person, but I also know that if you don't have the storytelling with the data, it is not received well or you're, li you're leaving out a certain population when you just present numbers. And the same way when you're doing storytelling, it's like, okay, that's great, but I need, some people need to see the tangibles behind it to get the policy pushed. So I believe that all that has to be together, especially the educating part, because I think this film did a great job of educating certain people that just didn't know or just not aware, or as the young film said, it was like, oh yeah, we gotta save sea turtles. We gotta change all our straws to paper because the turtles, <laughs> and it's like, Yes, love sea turtles, woohoo, but like we're talking about some serious, people are dying. That's what we need to talk about here. So I feel like when you have the education with the advocacy piece, with the um, data that drives policy, you can just um, touch the masses when it's all interconnected together. Okay, thank you for that. Um, let's see, Lynn Godfrey. As it relates to climate change, what do you feel an NGO and those who do the work in advocacy should focus on the most, policy, education, or advocacy? She said with this. Okay, let's move on. Wa, what do you think? What's your perception? I also have a hard time choosing. I'm kind of with Crystal in the sense that I would, but I'm also a data-oriented person. But mm -hmm. I understand that having a good story, good narrative, I mean, that's what the humans of New York is all about. You know, you have a story to go with the people so you can't get a feel for like the city and what it actually is. But I understand that like um, different NGOs have different, depend on the people who are involved, what kind of cap capability, skill set, and interest they would have. Now, if I'm now asking to rank them, I do feel that policy um, is is kind of taking priority for me because uh, you can have the most amazing technology to save the world and you can't use it just because it's a policy that bans the use of that technology. Um, case in point, I feel like you have a lack of policy at regular use of carbon-based fuel, so that means less incentives for companies and corporates to invest in renewables, despite the fact that like scientists are finding ways to manufacture solar panels. That's much more efficient and much more cost-effective. I mean, right. that was the case with the Sierra Club's documentary, Reinventing Power. That brings up the point I just made about solar panels. It's cheaper, it's, get, it's easier to make now, but then you don't have a policy that push for a company say, you got to invest in solar, pa solar panels, that's still not really happening. Now, as policy, once we have that, once we know what, what the issue is, then we know what sort of knowledge gap exists within the public. So this is where education comes in, where you help people get informed, so that now they know what to advocate for or advocate against. So this all ties in together. But maybe I 
for me, the if I were to draw like a, a tree of sorts, policy wise, what drives all the other, other action take place. Okay, thank you. Lynn, can you hear us now? I know you were having problems with your audio. You can, I'm not getting anything back. Okay, I'm sorry. See if you can work on it and let's move it to Drew. Drew, I'm gonna throw the same question out at you as it relates to climate change. How do you feel NGO and those who do the advocacy work? What should we focus on? Should we focus on the policy, focus on education, advocacy? Yeah, I think um, Crystal said it really well. I think um, it's really a combination of, of all uh, of those that kind of got to work together. And it, it, sometimes we have elected officials who just won't listen to the data. They won't, they won't see the people. They refuse to see the people there. And so um, we just have to, we have to have elected officials that can hear all sides and, and, and look at the data, but also have a heart and can connect to people and understand the, the struggles that they go through. Um, and that's our job as, as advocacy groups is to lift that up and give them the, this place to tell their stories. I agree. I mean, there are those who don't listen to what happened January the 6th. So, I mean, that's case in point. They see a, have a totally different perspective. I don't know if Lynn is back. Lynn, is your audio engaged now? I don't think she's here, hon. No, I, I think, think she left. And I think she's I think she, yeah. Charles, did you want to add anything to this? To the, uh, what do you think we should focus on? The policy, the education, or the advocacy? Um, to be honest, I, I agree with some of the others. I think they're all equally important. I, I honestly don't think one is more important than the others. Um, again, interconnected. Um, you know, having people be educated on whatever issue is only going to go as far as if we're able to, you know, at some point get policy change, right? Um, mm -hmm. If somebody, you know, in one of the bodies decides to pass policy on their own because of something that they're pulling for, um, and we're not educated on that. We may not even understand that at some point, somebody with the opposite view can roll that back, something that could be, be very beneficial to the community. And we'd be unaware because we hadn't been um, hip to, you know, how it affects us um, from a financial standpoint, a health standpoint, uh, whatever it is. So I think it's important for, you know, again, people to be out here organizing, protesting, but, you know, making sure the messaging is proper. Um, also to have people who are knowledgeable enough to want to, um, you know, pass policy and educate everybody. So we're all in the same loop um, to get it done. I would look at it as a multi-pronged approach the same way I would look at how to get uh, get the word out the same way. It has to be a social media component, but there definitely has to be a ground component as well as a media and a uh, website and blog component and, and, you know, certain other things. I don't put all my eggs in any basket. So it wouldn't be any other way when, you know, something like this, something this important is at stake. We need all pieces. Everybody has to be on the same page to get something done effectively long-term, not short-term. Thank you. Lynn, are you back with your audio? Is it working now or? Yeah, can you hear me now? I can, it's perfect. I'm yeah, yeah, because yeah. I guess, you know, all the pieces have to fit together. It has to be interdisciplinary. Uh, it, you know, it requires a village for sure. And, uh, you know, we have to have participatory uh, activism from the ground. And that's one good thing I think the, 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 the film did. It showed it, it, it starts the buzz in communities, in, in Black communities especially, where we have not been traditionally included environmental justice and racism into our overall social and racial uh, justice uh, um, issues. We have not. So that's, it's, we're beginning to do that now. And I'm glad to see that, that the community is beginning to understand the climate change because in fact, really the turtle is important and we is part of an ecosystem, but we want to get too much in the weeds with the community with that. But it is important, you know, and we have to understand that we're part of a larger ecosystem. But if we put too much emphasis on one thing and neglect the other, by like putting all of the emphasis on the turtle and ne neglecting how that turtle impacts our ecological system, then we lose, um, we lose sight, I think, of what, what, our, what our mission is. Okay. Well, thank you guys. We're right at like a minute after five. Um, Charles, thank you so much. Um, should we be looking for some more work in this line and this kind of genre in the future from you guys? What's your next project? Absolutely. Um, so while I can't speak on the next project, I, I will tell you guys for sure there are other things um, uh, coming up from the Hip Hop Caucus for sure. So please, uh, you know, stay tuned to, to the next things that we're going to be working on uh, for the foreseeable future for this year and next. 
And again, understand that with anything that the Hip Hop Caucus does, it will always be trying to figure out, uh, again, proper messaging and advocation for, uh, you know, that, that uh, intersection between, again, arts, music, politics, social justice. So, you know, stay tuned. We, we definitely have a lot more coming up. We want to be as impactful and effective as possible and, and fighting for change, fighting for equality, fighting for the environment all, and all the above. So thank you for that. And thank you. And that's going to wrap us up. I want to thank my guests today, our panelists, Drew Ball. Thank you. I want to thank Alicia, Gua, and Lynn Godfrey, uh, Charles, Crystal, everybody that participated today. I know we were supposed to be live, but, you know, things happen. But it will be placed onto uh, Charlotte Black Filmmakers uh, a Facebook page, and we'll be able to look at it later. You can drive your friends and send your friends to it. So until next time, thank you so much. Appreciate everyone. Great discussion. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye. They're going to leave it.